first of all good afternoon to all the audience my ta talk to, for today is polymer nano composites as chemi resistive sensors though you have been hearing all these talks from the last two two days and one very uh, the one which is the my, by my producer uh, predecessor dr renal paul which was very very interesting so i will be leaving the portions which overlap but i'll try to keep it as basic as it should be my topic is polymer nano composites as chemi resistive sensors i would be talking the plan of presentation is a little bit of introduction which i will not take much time because you've been hearing it uh, from the last two days then classification and application of vapor sensors few minutes i'll spend on that and then i will just focus on chemi resistive vapor sensors and then why we choose polymer nano composites for vapor sensing when we go for chemi resistive mechanism so once the this part is over then i will be taking you to polymer nano composites as chemi resistive vapor sensors and then what are the challenges because dr milal pandey has paul has very rightly said that in fabricating a sensor uh, it's not the composition the morphology how they are dispersed this all is a big big challenge for getting the reproducibility or the recoverability of the polymer nano composite or a, or a uh, sensor so how we can do that using various novel techniques in polymer nano composites i will be discussing that and then what's our approach we have in our group has uh, devised two or three novel approaches to for uh, to overcome these challenges i will be discussing that and some of the results of chemi resistive sensors prepared by our group so this was this is my plan of presentation so first i go to the introduction part i know this as you have been hearing this that uh, what is a sensor a sensor is a device that detects and responds to some type of input from the physical environment when i say the specific input can be light heat motion moisture pressure or any one of other environmental phenomena the output is generally a signal that is converted to human readable display at the sensor location or transmitted electronically over a network for reading or further processing so as per american national standard institute it sensors is a device which provides a usable output in response to a specified measurement so when i say usable output this is what exactly we want our sensors to put uh, to to give us as the output right the sensitivity selectivity all depends upon this usable output but when we go to the classification of sensors we really get confused because sometimes you have got a number of classification in some of the literature reviews you'll see classification is based on the type of reaction they'll say it is physical chemical or biochemical in some of the reviews you'll find that they classify the sensors based on the measuring mechanism for example whether the sensor is changing the resistance or it is changing the capacitance or inductance sensing or piezoelectricity so that is the classification based on measuring mechanism similarly we can also have the third classification which is based on the phases of analyte what sensor is measuring whether it is measuring a gas as dr minal paul has rightly said that he was he has been working on vapor sensor so do i i also work on vapor sensor so that is my classification is based on the phase of the analyte so gas liquid and solid particulate sensors then the last one is classification based on operating principle whether i am measuring the change in the optical properties or electrochemical properties or gravimetric properties so that is the small introduction about the classification of the sample uh, of the uh, sensors but now when it comes to my talk our today's focus talk it is regarding the chemi resistive vapor sensors means the phase which i am interested in is in the vapor and the mechanism which i am interested in chemi resistive the moment i say it is chemi resistive the moment as this means that i am very much interested in this mechanism that my resistance of the output should change the resistance of my sample right so that's why i have uh, uh, named it as chemi resistive vapor sensor now 
when I say the, why vapor gas sensors, you must be hearing that uh, very medical diagnostics. That was the previous talk, which talked that vapors are very important. Why are we so much interested in sensing the vapors, right? Because if you have to go for air quality monitoring, you have to go for vapor, sensing the vapors only, which are there polluting. Medical diagnostic, detection of explosives. This is a very, very new uh, field on very important one, I will be discussing about this only. And control of food quality is done by the vapor uh, gas sensors. Similarly, safety of industrial processes is done by the vapor gas sensors. So now, if I say air quality monitoring, you all know that unwanted release of pollutants has led to a serious focus on advanced monitoring technologies for environmental protection. So what exactly we are we are interested in knowing? We are interested in knowing these volatile organic compounds, right? Which originate from painting, oil, refining, and vehicle exhaust emissions. They are very, very hazardous, and they have significant effects on air quality and human health. So the detection of volatile organic compounds is of special importance to environmental safety. So that's one. Second is, I think that this topic has already been deliberated at length, that treating diseases at their earliest stages significantly increase the chance of survival while decreasing the cost of treatment. So this is actually breath analysis, which is a non-invasive technique. And it can monitor illness like lung cancer, diabetes, melanoma, breast cancer at the very earliest stages. And you have gone into the details in my, uh, by the uh, previous uh, speaker. Right. So this is again, I will be le uh, leaving this slide, but this was just a manifestation that if these H2S, ammonia, NO and toluene can be used to evaluate diabetes, then kidney malfunction, asthma and lung cancer respectively. So you just, this is a, such a non-invasive technique and Dr. Paul was very, very right that we need to do huge work on this because this is going to change the scenario. When it comes to detection of explosive, which is my area of work, we say that rapid and accurate detection of explosive has been a hot issue of global concern due to the deepening terrorism crisis. Now, the illegal blasts, which are done by the terrorists, they not only apply powerful military explosive, but also the less powerful improvised explosive made of, made up of commercial available chemicals like ammonium nitrate, potassium chlorate, which are very much easily available, and they turn it into explosive. Right? So we are concerned about that. Another thing we are concerned about is the major ones, TNT, DNT, RDX, if somebody is carrying those. Can we have the handheld devices which we can detect? Right? Yes. The answer is yes. When I say chemi-resistive sensors, yes, the answer is, has got something, some... Uh, uh, you can say applications over here. So here I can say that nanomaterial based chemi resistant air sensor can tackle this problem as well. Right? So different type of vapor sensors I've already done, but as I'm telling you, I'm dealing with chemi resistive sensors. So they are actually the sensing mechanism is electrical, though we have optical, calorimetric, acoustic, magnetic, and mechanic mechanical sensing mechanism, but our main focus in this talk is the electrical one. Now, what exactly do I mean by chemi-resistive sensors, right? A chemi-resistor is a material that changes its electronic and electrical resistance in response to changes in nearby chemical environment. For example, if I say this is the sensor, right? And this, these are the vapors which I want to detect. Now, the moment these vapor, they come in contact with this. This should be so selective, so, so sensitive that the moment these vapors come in contact with the sensor, there should be some change in the resistance. But for that, you must understand that it should also have some electrical properties. So when I have to design a chemi-resistive sensor, I have to take care of the electrical properties and how they vary on slight adsorption of these materials, because then I will be talking of the sensitivity, right? So I can say that chemi-resistors are a class of chemical sensors that rely on the direct chemical interaction between the sensing material and the analyte. And the sensing material and the analyte can interact by covalent bonding, it can interact by hydrogen bonding or molecular recognition. They are widely used in real-time applications 
owing to their selectivity, they are highly selective, sensitive, simple in fabrication, compactness, and lower operating temperature and lower power consumption. Right? So we can say, what are the materials? As I'm telling that we need to have a material which should be chemi resistive. But what are the materials? If you can see, the latest research only talks about three materials either metal oxide semiconductors or conducting polymers or carbon based nanomaterials such as graphene, CNT, etc. So, if one has to uh, fabricate a chemi resistive sensor, he or she has to rely on these three. But now the problem is all of these three are having certain limitations. For example, if I go for metal oxide semiconductors and you will find that in literature, this is the main uh, uh, material which is being used for chemi resistive semiconductors. They have grown in popularity due to, the, due to their low cost, reliability, low power consumption and long operational lifespan. Now the what metal oxides are being used? Tungsten oxide, zinc oxide, tin oxide, titanium oxide, iron oxide, silicon oxide have the potential for vapor sensing. I think some of the examples have already been done in the last uh, lecture. Right. But when it comes to fabricating them, sometimes these sensors have very poor sensitivity at room temperature and they work at very high temperature. This is one of the major drawback of these metal oxide semiconductors. Second one is because now you need higher operating temperatures. So their sensor result in poor solubility. So that is the second, uh, you can say, challenge. The third one is that operation of such devices at elevated temperature require a distinct temperature controlled complex heating assembly. So this will what? This will consume extra power. So now these are some of the limitations. Though possessing high sensitivity, they are very good. Very, they've got very good high the high sensitivities, but still. Utilization of such sensors for certain application is exceptionally restricted. So what do we need? We need to design a room temperature. So we need a room temperature operated gas sensor to obtain the desired figure of merits, including long term stability. So that's one. When it comes to carbon based uh, materials, such as CNPs, nanographite, graphene, they have attracted more attention because of their unique properties. And they are again have become very, very promising materials for high sensitive gas sensors. These materials have been found to possess electrical properties and highly sensitive to extremely small quantities of gases at room temperature. Please see, we are talking of room temperature now, right? So therefore, their high sensitivity eliminates the need of assisting technologies because when the sensitivity is not high, then we have to pre-concentrate, right? So here we do not require any pre-concentration of the analyte, right? So we can have a low cost, low weight and simple configuration of carbon-based nanomaterials. But still, again, some problems are there. Their mechanical strength is a problem. How to form a device, that's a problem. Right, then carbon nanotube sensors can be made more selective by using a polymer as a barrier, right? Doping the nanotubes with hydroatoms or adding functional groups. So these are some of the strategies we actually take care to resolve their mechanical strength, their high selectivity and other things which I will be discussing in my later slides. Now the third material which we need to discuss is Polymer based vapor sensors. When I say polymer wave based vapor sensors, I, as I'm telling you that it should have electrical properties. So electrical properties are there in the conducting polymers. I think you all must be knowing that polymers are insulators, but nowadays a number of research groups are working on conducting polymers like polypyrrol, polyaniline, polythiophene. They have been active layers of gas sensors since 1980. So in comparison with sensors based on metal oxides, which operate at very high temperatures, the sensors which are made of conducting polymers, they have very, very many improved characteristics. What are those improved characteristics? High sensitivities, short response times, they operate at room temperature. This is something very, very important one. 
right? And then if they are operating at room temperature, naturally their cost will go down. So low cost of fabrication. Then one very important thing is simple and portable structures which are required at the, for example, one has to check your baggage, one has to at railway stations. So you just do, you cannot carry the whole machines over there. You cannot carry the whole equipment over there. It should be very simple and portable structures. And then reproducibility, have good mechanical property. So these are some of the important, uh, I can say, benefits of using the polymer-based gas sensors. Right, so the so limitations, but still, still they also have the limitations now. Now, what are the limitations? The limitations is long time instability. Sometimes they are having this problem of irreversibility and poor selectivity. Furthermore, if you go to the literature, you will see the working principles of polymer as sensing materials still need a clearer and more convincing explanation. So now we've got the three materials and three materials, they have got their benefits as chemical resistive materials, but they've got their challenges as well. So now what can we do? We can do this, that the shortcomings of organic materials, such as low conductivity, poor stability, and of the inorganic materials, such as some semiconductors, that is they require uh, operation at high temperatures, etc. So we, how do we overcome this? We can functionalize the polymer. We can just mix them. We take the polymer, mix it with metal, metal oxide, semiconductor, uh, metal oxide, carbon-based material, and we get a polymer nanocomposites. What it will do? It will give me the, uh, you can say, the feasibility that we can, two types of materials are there. So all the benefits I'll get, and I may then, synergize the two so that they can op be operational at low temperatures at room temperatures so i'm just taking the benefit of both the both the things and then i'm making the polymer nanocomposites now when i say polymer nanocomposites if before i go for polymer nanocomposites that's the second part of my talk i think you all know what are the indicators for a sensor but uh, i will just recap when I say sensitivity, because I will be using these terms when I'll be discussing polymer nanocomposites, the sensitivity is defined in terms of relationship between input physical signal and output electrical signal. For example, the sensitivity is generally the ratio between a small change in the electrical signal and a small change in the physical signal. For example, we say thermometer. We say it is high sensitive, it is very high sensitivity because if a very small temperature change result in large voltage change. So then we say the sensitivity is very high. Next is selectivity. That is actually a big problem when we talk of chemical resistive sensors or sensors in general. Because if the sensor is sensitive, it will be less selective because it will start sensing all the vapors. Right, so selectivity is another problem. Selectivity means the ability of gas sensor to identify a specific gas among gas among gas mixtures. The next is response time. The period from the time when gas concentration reaches a specific value to that when sensor generates a warning signal. For example, you have to sense the vapors, right? It should be in seconds. It's not that it is taking minute. By then, the bomb will explode. So response time should be very, very fast. Then reversibility. It should be reusable, right? You can see here that if you, it should be this much reversible. This is one of my paper where I've uh, taken this uh, diagram from. So this is reversible. Like the moment the vapors of that analyte is removed, again, it comes back to its own resistance. Once it is again subjected, so you can say this is reversibility. It's very much reversible. Recovery time. How much time does it take from the sensor to go from this signal and come back? So this is the recovery time. So these are some of the uh, factors. And then environmental factors which we have to take while fabricating a sensor. That is temperature range, humidity effects, energy consumption, the economical factors we have to take care of fabrication cost, availability, and lifetime. <clears throat> With that, now let's go for polymer nanocomposites as chemiresistive sensors. Let me tell you, friends, that they are also not free of challenges. 
right as all the speakers have been telling you time and again that we are trying to increase the efficiency of the polymers or efficiency of the sensors right so how do we increase the efficiency of the sensors first we need to understand that what all is causing their sensing abilities what all is affecting their sensing abilities so when i go to polymer nanocomposite as chemical chemical resistive sensors we know that why do we need why do we go for polymer composites because they are versatile you can see the polymers how versatile are these device fabrication becomes very easy you just have to flip the film into the device they are very lightweight so when i talk of handheld devices yes polymer composites are the best low energy consumption because polymer composites if i go for chemical resistive they just need very very low energy operational temperature room temperature where they are working low cost the potential to be adapted for many different applications right so as you all know now i need to understand that what is that which is actually making it sensitive and selective for a chemi as a chemi resistive sensor right so what can i do as the speakers have been telling you that you have to change the composition you have to change the morphology so the sensitivity and the efficiency of your sensor is dependent upon the composition and the morphology and how these two substances are intertwined with each other right when i say composite composite means a metric phase phase which is a continuous phase and the dispersed phase in which we disperse for example in polymer nanocomposites i'm telling you polymer is the metric phase in which i have to put the nanoparticles or the semiconducting materials so that they can have synergy but now the problem is which our group has very well uh, understood is that when we actually combine the polymer with the nanoparticles they have their own benefit the polymer has its own benefit so what benefit we are getting when we are mixing and where the benefit lies if i go for this area if you can see this area where this, this is the you can say the particle which is dissolved so it will be having its own property nothing new because this is this is this is the portion where particle will be having the property and if i go for this portion this portion will be the polymer so polymer will be having its own properties nothing new so where am i getting the new properties of the nanocomposites i am getting the new properties of the polymer at the interface we have to understand that this is the new material which we are talking of when we are mixing the polymer and the nanoparticles so we have to actually take care of the interface right i will be discussing this in more detail so how do we choose a matrix and the filler now we know that for chemi resistive i need a semi conducting material how i can get that semi conducting material if i use a insulating polymer i have to add a conducting nano filler or if i am using a conducting polymer then any nano filler can take place a nano filler can be added so my actually the semiconductors the my conductivity should of the material should lie in this area but this is not sufficient we need to do more what we need to more this these are some of the applications of polymer nanocomposites not only in sensor we have the application of polymer nanocomposites in electronics in aeronautics in solar panels actuators biosensors flexible electrodes and conductive inks as well right but now what is the challenge when we make the polymer nanocomposites the dominating factor in the development of nanocomposites as sensor is the interface as i'm telling you between the matrix and the filler this is actually the interface is the one which is actually giving me the new properties the interface is the one which is actually synergizing the properties of both the filler and the matrix or the filler and the, yes the filler and the matrix so it controls the property and if these nanoparticles are not are, are poorly dispersed the interfacial interaction is low right between the nanoparticle and the polymer you will not get the properties you are thinking to be right so the main challenge in preparing polymer nanocomposite is to disperse the nanoparticles well within the polymer matrices and improve polymer nanoparticle interfacial interaction then you can see i will be 
sharing some of the examples that how the efficiency jumps right so poor interfacial interaction again you can see the same figure i'm uh, i've drawn here that these are the particles this is the matrix so where you are getting this small portion where the particle and this they are forming a compound a new compound is actually made at the interfacial region right and if you can see in a zoomed image you can say this is something which is giving me the new property because this is the polymer it is giving me its own property in the bulk this is the nanoparticle it is giving me the its own property i am getting some new property over here and you will be surprised to know that people are now talking of interfaces that it's polymer composite or in any composites because if the mechanical students are there or mechanical faculty is there we are talking of composites in everywhere but composite means what composite that you should have new properties at interfaces interfaces are giving you the properties and number of books are already there for polymer nano composite interfaces and they say that is actually the hidden lever which controls the properties of the composites right so having said that we can again i have already explained this i'll just uh, i leave that so now when i say i have for example now in my case i have used ngps as the filler nano graphite platelets i tell you why and then polymer and it's not that i'll just mix them you will find millions of paper where just mixing and then getting the properties yes you get some enhancement in the properties but that's not all when we are talking of efficiency when we are talking of highly efficient sensors we need to understand the chemistry and what exactly is transpiring between the filler and the uh, polymer right where the new properties are coming from and that area has to be increased right so when i say to implement the novel properties of nano composite sensors processing methods that lead to controlled particle size distribution dispersion and interfacial interactions are critical if you can see when you go for preparing a composite right or nano composite we just go for in situ polymerization we just take the nano particles we just take the monomer and we polymerize it and we say this is a polymer nano composite yes it has got certain merits similarly melt processing that's another technique we take the polymer we take the nano particles melt uh, processing we just take this and then we dry it and we say this is a nano composite ultrasonic mixing is another one molding we just take two nano graphite polymer mold it and we get a molded compound solution mixing we take the solution of the nano particle solution of the polymer mix it right electropolymerization but all these you can say processing technique are not talking or and they are not paying any attention to the interface because if we can pay any attention to interface yes we can have the very good properties so now these approaches suffer from certain disadvantages such as poor interfacial interaction lack of uniform dispersion low efficiency incompetent to control the reaction condition less control on molecular weight of polymer lack of control of reaction condition so now what do we do because the strategy is the same so our objective was to synthesize the polymer nano composite using different processing techniques right and we wanted to prepare novel polymer nano composite with very much interest in the interfaces then we also wanted that they should have the polymer nano composite should have increase in flexibility durability electrical and sensor properties right and then our third objective was to evaluate these for chemical vapor sensor and compare that whether the when the nano composites are made up of these traditional or conventional technique and by our technique what is what is the difference and you will be surprised the difference was huge right we took two polymers thermoplastic polymer we took polymethyl methacrylate and polystyrene and conducting polymer we took pedot polyethylene dioxythiophene polystyrene so this these are the um, polymers which i took as matrices and then for reinforcing i took the nano graphite platelets i think you must be knowing that among different conducting fillers a range of carbon based fillers have gained prominence due to they are inert their density is very very low they are very light and compatibility with most of the polymers but out of all these 
we are relying on nanographite platelets. Why nanographite platelets? Because as I'm telling you that we are focusing on all the parameters, cost even, right? If, I, if you go for graphene, graphene is the best, but that cost is a hampering point. So we, we went for nanographite platelets. Why? Because what exactly do you mean by nanographite platelets? If graphene is a one atom thick planar sheet of sp2 bonded carbon atoms, then NGP are actually two or three sheets, but they have got similar properties as that of single graphene. Layered structure with plane stiffness, high electrical conductivity, high thermal conductivity, high specific area, and low cost of production. So with this, we started with NGPs, right? So. But now the problem with NGP is it is hydrophobic, chemically inert. Now it will not, it will not go for proper dispersion in polymer. So the whole pro pro uh, problem is, uh, sorry, the whole problem is still there, right? Because we are talking of proper dispersion in polymer to enhance the properties. If it is not dispersed, then what is the use? So what do we do? Our approach is that these are some of the approaches we have started, our group has started. We have prepared the polymer nanocomposites through click reaction. That is one approach. Another is use of swift heavy ions. Third is grafting of polymer matrix on the filler. Third is fourth is thioene reaction between matrix and the filler. Right. So today I will be discussing these two click reaction and use of swift heavy ions. So first I'll go for a click reaction to prepare polymer nanocomposites. What is a click reaction? Very interesting one. We have synthesized the polymer polystyrene NGP by click chemistry, and then we have prepared and evaluated it with for hydrogen peroxide sensor. Right? What is click chemistry? Click chemistry is a concept which was introduced by K. Very Sharpless in 2001. Very new concept, right? And it says that when we have to join the two component, in my case, it is polymer and the graphene, what we can do? We can have one component having one functional group and another component having very active another functional group, right? And then when we click, when we click, it is not that it will be physical mixing, it will be chemical mixing because then you can see that this is one component, this is another component, this is alkyne, this is azide. Then alkyne azide linkages, the moment you mix these two, they have got affinity for each other and they will form this one and this is the polymer and this is the graphite and this is how they are properly you can say mixed or you can say chemically mixed so this is the concept which is being used in biology but this concept was used by our group why because we can do all the reactions in aqueous condition so green chemistry also we can we could satisfy Shorter reaction times within one day I can prepare high yield modular. My it's on to me where I would like that my polymer should interact with the uh, graphene and it is stereo specific. So with these benefits we started and first this is uh, just experimental. We prepared NGPs by modified Hummers method. If you uh, know that NGPs are layered structure, the main challenges to separate these layer, exfoliate these layer. So first, graphene. this is a very standard method. I think if the people who are working on graphene, they know that this is a very standard method to exfoliate the graphite. Exfoliation means that this is the layered graphite and exfoliation means that I want that they should be separated so that polymer can go inside. So when I say that from here to here, we have gone through the Hammers method, right? So now we've got these NGPs, which are actually the layered graphene particles, right? And now this is, what do we do? As I told you, if you go to the quick reaction, first I have to introduce certain functional group over here. And then I have to introduce the functional group to the polymer. So this is what I have done and I've shown it here, that in NGPs, I have introduced the functional group. This is a proper chemistry. I'm not going into details of that. But you can see now NGP has got this active group, alkyne group, very, very active group, right? Similarly, this is my polystyrene, which is a polymer. And this is, again, I go by the chemistry thing, chemistry route, and I introduce a Zide group here. So now it has got a very facile 
alkyl group here and azide group here. So two components are there. I'm not mixing them as such, right? I am trying to, when I mix them, there should be a reaction between these two. And this is what exactly happened when I mix these two, these reaction happened and this polystyrene, which is a polymer, it was linked to the graphene through this triazole linkage, right? So what I got out of this, I what I got is, you can see that this is the alkyne functionalized material has tuned the material to exhibit high density than its precursor. For example, this is NGP, very light. The moment I functionalize it in alkyne, it's only for graphene, it goes down. And now when I mix it with the polymer, you can see what a homogeneous solution I've got. Otherwise, if you go by the other mixing methods, you can see that it is something like this. You've got the polymer solution and you can see the dispersed polymers like this, the dispersed graphite particles like this. And then these are casted into the films. And even in the films also, you have the matrix where the ND particles, which will be very much visible and they will be not be dispersed properly. But in here, you can see how proper solution has been formed of the polymer composite, which was then casted into a film, right? These are some of the techniques. I do not know how many of you must be interested to know that whether this reaction has taken place. As I'm telling you, I'll just go by a very small one. For example, I told you that azide linkages is there in my polymer. Right. So when I mix this azide linkage is gone in my composite. So this means that azide linkage has reacted. Yes, it has reacted with this. Right. So this is the confirmation or the characterization of the uh, peaks. Similarly, whether it has what I am talking of the click reaction, whether it has taken place or not, was also verified by the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is again one of the technique to know. And then XRD also, and it was very interesting XRD, because when I say NGPs, nanographite platelets, as I'm telling you, I'm, I'm interested in how the exfoliation, what is the D distance between the different layers of the graphite. So initially it was 0 0.37 nanometer. Then it was 0 0.37 nanometer. And when I linked it with azide, as I, alkyne or azide, alkyne linkage is Germanicia, functionalized here. So it actually increased to 0 0.54. So you can see that it exfoliated further. And exfoliation is very good for me. So it exfoliated. This distance was 0 0.54 nanometer, 0 0.454 nanometer. Right. And then when I mix this with polymer, again, it, though it decreased, but still it remains 0 0.44 because and much larger than 0 0.37 nanometer of the bare NGPs. Right. So these all these three peaks were confirmed by the XRD. Right. And then we got we had gone for the thermogravimetric analysis, which showed a very good spectrum that the polymer nanocomposite lie in between these two. So you can see the properties. It, shows that the properties are synergistically taken up by the polymer nanocomposite, right? So then you can see these are the same image, petal-like structures of NGPs at 2 micron, bare and flat-like structures of NGPs. These are simple NGPs, nanographite platelet after the Hummers method, right? And these are the topography of the CNCs. Again, we can see the layered structure through the TEM. Uh, Right. And once we got all these characterization, we were confirmed that, yes, the polymer nanocomposites have been formed and interspaces are there. And when the interspaces are there, this means the density of the interspaces are more because more exfoliation means more those interspaces or you can say interstitial sites, sites. Right. So we wanted to see how it actually is evaluated against the hydrogen peroxide vapor sensor because this is being used as crude explosive devices the terrorists are using this uh, because it's very much available in the market so they use it as very crude one right so we are and specifically workers which are working in the industries they are also exposed to hydrogen peroxide vapors so that sensor was highly required and this is the uh, setup wherein we uh, actually find out the 
uh, we just test the sensor through the Keithley electrometer. And the, this is the sensor which I put to the hydrogen peroxide vapors, vapors. So it detects and then it gives me the image, right? This is a very crude method. Now we've got another one, which is the OVG sensor. OVG gives me a very proper PPM or PPB type of uh, uh, concentration of the analyte uh, through these permeation tubes, which I can uh, find out through my sensor. So instead of this setup, setup ki jaga, I can put this oil stone OVG4 center. So now you can see that the resistance of these composites before exposure to hydrogen peroxide uh, vapor was measured at 1.08 into 10 raised to the power 8 ohms. The moment it was exposed to hydrogen peroxide, it becomes it goes down and it decreases to 1.29 to 10 raised to the power 6. Two orders changed from 10 raised to power in the 10 raised to the power 8 to 10 raised to the power 6. Two orders change means it is very much detectable. Even with a very, very simple technique, it is very de detectable. Right? And the sensor gives you an immediate response. Just three seconds. Right? And then if it gives you a response in three seconds, and then you expose it to the air, and it is recovered within 60 seconds, you will get full recovery of the sensor. Right? And now selectivity that whether the sensor is sensitive to others also other vapors also so it was just checked with other vapors and it shows excellent reproducibility and reversibility right so the highlights are the judi judicial selection of click reaction has improved polymer pillar dispersion of cnc polymer composites it's a promising sensor material which gives a spontaneous response within three seconds of exposure to hydrogen peroxide vapors with complete recovery at room temperature by just exposing the sensor to air, right? And this says the sensor has the potential to be used as fabrication of efficient, portable, handheld device for hydrogen peroxide sensing at low cost. And this result is already published in RSC Advances. Similarly, we wanted, I will not go into the details of this, but I just want to tell you that sometimes it so happens that we want to have a sensor which is mechanically very, very strong because when we say portable, we have to take it everywhere. So now we applied the same strategy and we uh, uh, synthesized a mechanically strong interface. I'm just telling you that how if you think in the right direction and if you think the target, you can start with the good raw materials. With the appropriate raw materials to get the target. So what we did, because mechanical strength was lacking in the previous one, so we took now here, we just go for the thermoplastic polymer, P with polymethyl methacrylate, which is very, very mechanically strong. And we did the same thing, click reaction. We, NGPs were, were uh, you can say, uh, functionalized by alkyne group. Then uh, polymethyl acrylate was functionalized by the azide group. These two were clicked. And this is the polymer nanocomposite which was formed. And you will be surprised to know, I will just go to the next to next slide, that again, these are some of the characterization techniques which we have, do have been uh, doing, which we have done to find out that whether the reaction has taken place or not, whether the groups have been uh, comprised, uh, have been uh, interacted properly or not so all these have been done and then again through the nmr spectroscopy we found out right you can see these are the ngps flake like structures this is the polymethyl methacrylate now you can see i would like to show you this this is the pnc show most of the this was before you can say this is simple uh graphite when we say pncs you can see that very thinner sheet of uh, uh, denographite is there, right? So thinner sheet means it might have exfoliated properly. So this has been exfoliated in the polymethyl methacrylate met matrix. And this was very much clear in uh, TEM images, where you can see that this is the NGP, and these are the alkyne functionalized NGPs. Again, more thinner. The moment you go for alkyne functionalization, more thinner. Thinner means that they are exfoliated, right? So these are also the results were also verified through the atomic force microscopy, right? And then, because this was our main concern that we wanted that our 
elastic modulus or your our hardness these are the mechanical properties should be improved and you can see yes our elastic properties or the mechanical properties were hugely improved for example 87.8 percent improvement was shown by the polymer composite this again tell you tells that if the polymer and the nanograffite particles are properly mixed which ensures the proper dispersion right and proper dispersion means the density of the interfaces is very high density of interface is very high means that new compound which is being formed at various places is very high right then the properties enhancement in the property will naturally be very very high right so it is 7.8 percent increase in the elastic modulus 123.5 percent increase in the hardness right so very very much mechanical strong polymers and then you can see how beautifully this is the film which can be twisted which can be rolled which can bend and why am i telling you this because this is the sensor which can fit into any device right because sometimes the device fabrication requires your sensor to be molded or rolled or twisted so this can give this gives me all those kind of uh, facilities right and the mechanical strength why the mechanical huge mechanical strength because i have got these triazoles at the interfaces and triazoles are very very because otherwise in what other groups were doing they're just mixing it and when they wanted to have mechanical strength they may separate out because it's just a simple mixing was there very either they were just adhering to each other through hydrogen bonds or wonder wall forces here they are not they are actually adhering to each other very with very strong bonds. If they are adhering to each other with very strong bonds, the stability is very high and the mechanical strength is very, very high. And then we actually treated this for ammonia sensor for industries, not for breath. Breath requires the PPB levels. We have not reached to that uh, level. But for ammonia sensors in industries where leakage of ammonia is a big problem because it reduces the pressures in the walls. So there we have used, uh, we had for that purpose we have made it and we could uh, publish these results and you can see that here if you can see the self-standing PNC this is just a self-standing PNC uh, PNC means polymer and composites it demonstrated excellent sensor properties towards ammonia vapor with quick response two seconds and recovery within 32 seconds at room temperature again I'm telling you room temperature we are talking of only at room temperature, nothing, no equipment is required to increase the temperature, right? And again, the sensitivity is very high, two orders, 10 raised to power 4 to 10 raised to power 6 on exposure to ammonia vapor. So the highlights are again the same, that highly flexible and mechanical strong films were formed, right? And having the uh, sensor can work at room temperature and one more thing with this sensor it could work at zero degree centigrade also we have just uh, tested it at zero degree centigrade as a cold environment also right so it could be it was working over there also right so now that was all about click chemistry but then this is a very interesting next one which is the last uh, uh, topic of my uh, talk swift heavy ions I used swift heavy ions for properly dispersing my polymer, uh, my reinforcing material, or you can say NGPs into the polymer. And the results were simply excellent. I will just show you. First, let's understand what are swift heavy ions. These are the ions with high energy ranging from few tens of million electron volts to giga electron volts. So when these ions, they impinge any polymer, for example, these are the polymer, they actually amorphize the polymer they just give the uh, you can say if they pin they penetrate the solids as well as the polymers but when they penetrate they change the morphology right if you remember the previous speaker was telling you about that morphology is very much important so i am just trying to change the morphology right so once change the morphology by using these the swift heavy ions so when they interact with my method they actually scatters the electrons or they scatter the uh, electrons from the nuclei of the atom. Right. So I will just show what exactly is done. For example, if my polymer is there and this is the 
polymer or the, any other material, even solids. They are modified. Swift heavy ions are used to change the morphology of the solids also. So this is the ion beam. And this uh, swift heavy ion beams goes with a great accelerated high ion beam goes inside and it actually changes the morphology, right? And sometimes what we do, we just want a change in the morphology. We don't want this atom to stay here, this, uh, sorry, this ion to stay here. So what I do, I just choose the thickness of the, my, my material only this much, right? So therefore it comes and it goes. So it has produced some changes in the morphology. So that is known as the ion irradiation. Right here, the ion beam, the ion is not implanted. Ion has gone out just after doing some of the morphological changes in my polymer, it has gone out. Another technique is what we do, we just take the ion beam, though at a lower uh, energy, and we try that ion should go as a dopant in my polymer. It stays there, though it disrupts the structure, the structure will be disrupted, but it will change the, you can say, morphology and it will stay there. So I have done the experiment on both ion irradiation also and ion implantation also. So if I say ion irradiation, so I have prepared the ion irradiated material for detection of nitrobenzene, which is actually a precursor to an explosive. So very simple methodology. I took a conducting polymer, polyethylene dioxythiophene PSS polymer, and I mix this very simple technique which I have been discussing. Just dono ko mix karna. Just mix it in a beaker, ultrasonicate it, and form a film. Now, once I form a film, this film was subjected because now if I say film, as I'm telling you that you will be having these nanoparticles, uh, uh, the aggregates of these particles which are not very much uniformly uh, distributed, right? So after these, this is being formed. This film was irradiated with. A nickel beam and the carbon ion beam. First, I will be discussing the results only on the nickel. So let's concentrate on nickel ion beam. So when I pass the nickel ion beam through this, this caused number of changes in the morphology. Right? So what is done? First change to, yes, a morphology. And I can say that initially, when it is not irradiated, right? The, when it is not irradiated, I tested unirradiated film against nitro uh, benzene vapors. Right? When I checked it, though it showed the composite film showed some changes. Sorry, the composite film showed some changes. Right? It is the film which is not subjected to the irradiation and just casted like the methods, conventional methods only. Right, but still, as I'm telling you, that even the conventional method so shows some change. So we wanted to know that change. The change was there, but the resist response time was 1.15, and the sensitivity was just 18.5 percent, which is again good. And we could publish this paper, and we could file a patent also. Till then, we were not doing any work on swift heavy ions. But then, when we took this work to when we prepared these membranes, and, and this is actually, you can see the, these membranes which are not subjected to the irradiation. You can see the particles are agglomerated, not properly dispersed, right? You can see the bundles over here, bundles over here, right? So though still we could get some results, but we're not very happy with the uh, dispersion phenomena, right? So what we did, we just irradiated it. And now you can see what irradiation has done. Just see the polymers over here, right? And just is a nano composite over here before irradiation. And now see the polymers over here after irradiation, right? How beautifully and uniformly your nano graphite platelets are dispersed in the polymers. When they are dispersed in the polymers, so number of interfaces, you can see the density of interfaces at every phase, there will be an interface, new material, new material, right? So if this much is there, so naturally we are expecting that then the efficiency would be that much. It should increase, right? So we tested these membranes. You can see here also, this is before, this is after, again, the exfoliated and the structure, layered structure tells me that it is properly exfoliated. This That is with nickel ions and this is with carbon ions. Both of the ions, please remember, when I'm telling you ion irradiation, I have taken the thickness of the film so that ion is not staying in the 
polymer matrix. Iron is going, just making a change, going up. That's it. But that change has really made all the difference. That change has dispersed my nanographite properly in the polymeric film, which I was actually doing through click reaction or through other reactions. So what exactly this iron beam might have done? How? Why I have got this structure? Why? Why? Because this is the theory which was given by us that both the matrix and the nanographite, actually iron beam has modified both, right? Because in, initially they were just dispersed like this. Now during irradiation, what happens that the high energy of the sheet, right? It creates a cylindrical molten zone for a very few nanoseconds, very few. But that molten zone, for example, your these are this is the polymer which was and these are the platelets, right? So for very few seconds, this molten zone was prepared and the polymer could seep into these platelets. And the polymer could seep into these platelets so that dispersing it, dispersing them further, right? So this is viscous polymer could easily diffuse into the gallery of the nanofiller to cause more intercalation or you can say exfoliation. So this is the chemistry behind that. And when we see the sensor properties, you can see for the same films, I have used a uh, same thickness film. If it was 16.5%, it goes to 38.3%. Nothing, no new chemical is added. No new component is added. Nothing. Just a few seconds irradiation and you can see that the sensitivity is almost uh, doubled. I think it's more than double. Right? And this was a very good paper which was published uh, in the Journal of Physical Science because the concept was very good, very new. And then this was the irradiation. Now we also tried how what will happen if I implant the particles onto the polymer nanocomposites, right? So this is another example where we just took again the same thing. We just prepared the nanographite films. And now here we took the thickness so that, for example, the thickness was this much. The, poly, the iron, it doesn't go out and it is implanted over here. The particles which are there should be implanted over here. And I took carbon ones. Why I could took carbon ions? Because I never wanted any impurity or any other effect to, because then I wanted to compare the results. So if, because nanographite is a carbon, carbon material, so I wanted to put carbon only so that otherwise my results, I would have been confused whether the increased uh, sensitivity or the efficiency is due to some other ion or not. So I, saved myself from that and I just took carbon. So this is how, how it has it was done that I took carbon and then first I prepared the polymethyl methacrylate films and I put NGP simple method in situ polymerization and then I impinged carbon ions. And again you can see this is without the un unirradiated one. Again you can see the agglomeration, Hitasar agglomeration, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But when I put the carbon particles or you can say I impinge it though the density of the carbon particles is much much higher naturally because I am impinging it with carbon and the dispersion is again very much uniform right and then I tested it against uh, the uh, I can say um, uh, for its uh, sensitivity for nitrobenzene vapor and you can see that sensitivity also increased to double 77.8 percent response is 77.8 percent to nitrobenzene so you can see just simple impinging right so that is the conclusion is the ngps are very promising nanofiller for polymeric materials for sensor applications the main challenge of homogeneous dispersion of nanofiller in the polymer matrix was successfully overcome by the click reaction or by the swift heavy ions and both of them have given us very good result. And uh, the nanocomposites have shown remarkable potential to be used as chemical sensors, showing sensitivity as higher as 60 to 75% with good reproducibility, recovery, and excellent stability. And they have the, as gas sensors, they have, they have the potential to be used in fabrication of efficient, portable, and handheld devices. This is something which our main aim is 
for sensing various analytes at low cost. We are also working tremendously to prepare the array of the these uh, sensors so that we can go for handheld devices. This is the, uh, we can say, um, presently we are doing, to uh, this is the present work we are doing to prepare this handheld devices. And this is my, I am working on hydrogel group and nanocomposite. This is my group. All the work has, which I've been citing here is done by my students, my PhD students. And these are some of the acknowledgements because we, for iron uh, beam interaction, I have done it through IUAC Center, New Delhi. And then I go for my characterization to IIT and then uh, to CSIR. And then this work is also done uh, in uh, along with the <coughs> collaboration with Taiwan and Nottingham University. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Any questions I would like to take? Or maybe, maybe. Uh, sir, can I unshare my slides now? Uh, yeah. So, you have anything? Are you already done? So, let's uh, check the questions. So, so uh, yeah, this question is from uh, Manisha Sharon. Uh, I am uh, taking this question. Uh, what is the method of preparation of polymer-based sensors? Uh, as I have already discussed, that for polymer-based sensors, and if you have to go for chemi-resistive ones, the first and foremost thing is that you have to go for the semiconductor range because resistance change should be there with the uh, sample and with the sensor. If the resistance change is not there, then you're, you cannot talk about chemi-resistive sensors. So if you take a polymer and if it is an insulating one, then you please incorporate the conducting material. And if you take a conducting polymer, for example, sometimes people also wish to use semiconductor materials, which I have been discussing that there are three types. So if you want to take a semiconductor material, so in semiconductor material, you can say that uh then you can do ha you have to choose conducting polymer because then and then only the conductance of the composite would come in the semiconductor range so once it comes in the semiconductor range then you can play with that the how it changes with the when it is interacted with the analyte yeah so manisha I, I i hope you got the answer for the question thank you madam and now we move to the next question uh so again, next question is uh, from Manisha. Uh, Bragg angle value can be taken in degrees or radius uh, or radian in XRD yes. for serial method calculation. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yes, it can be taken in both. But we are here concerned about the D value. You are very right. It can be taken as uh, Scherer equation gives you that uh, flexibility to degree and uh, radian. That's very true. But here we are interested in Bragg's equation. We are we are. Uh, talking of D spacing because the layer separation is actually very much reflected by the D spacing. So here we are not talking of that two theta values or radian and this. We are talking of D spacing, right? And we are using Bragg's equation for that. I'm not uh, used for a general equation over here. Yeah, so again, uh, Madam, you have a lot of appreciation in between participants are writing this. Uh, okay. Nice presentation, madam. Wonderful session, wonderful session, informative. So I'm not going through that all. I'm just moving to the other question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this question is uh, from Dr. P.B. Rajeshwari. Yes, what sir. is the pros uh, prosperity of sensors with biopolymers? That's very good question. And I am also working on that. If you can see that biopolymers, because they are proteins, right? So there, when we are, we, we have started that work with the soy and chitosin, chitosin, and you can see that those, if you can say soy proteins, right, or you can say chitosin. So they have got very good functional groups and they interact with the vapors very nicely and they can produce a big change in the outcome, right? So that is, if you can do that work, that will be a very good one. And you can immobilize the antigens onto that. 
if you have to prepare that sensor you can immobilize the antigen to that so that it captures the analyte and give you a change right so that possibility is very very uh, good and it's a very upcoming field number of people are working on this uh, even in csir etc so you can go for that yeah so uh, uh, on particip participant we have uh, madam uh, i want to ask one question because because when we connect many of the fdps and then pro, uh, this uh, participant basically from the private institute whenever i we suggest something and they say that we don't have the facilities we don't have uh, this much and we are private institute so i have this very good question for you miss uh, your university is also private university and you have carried out a lot of work and then i i hope the other uh, professors should also be able to do the same kind of work so how this uh, your university is maintaining this and what suggestion you can give to the other private universities uh, to maintain the research quality or to the quality research work so uh, you sir, can thank you so much uh, for this question uh, i would like to very proudly say that ours is a research driven university and in our university we have to actually we are given the facilities and we have uh, through the funded projects etc we have got enough uh, instrumentation available so that we can carry out our research and what exactly i should say that as a teacher as a professor i think the main thing is that if i am a good researcher then i am a good teacher so when we go because we are running msc courses also we got 6 months training in the last semester and in even at a bsc level also we incorporate our students to think in terms of research we give them assignments in terms of research right so if they are doing that and when they finish their msc they are very much interested in doing phd's etc that is one second when it comes to the facilities you are very much right that initially private universities were not actually given funding by the uh, government but now the government has become very generous and it is giving us funding and i am telling you that in amit university we've got lots of funded we've got funds from dst csir uh lots of fun, funds are there we have got the equipments through fist programs and now because thankfully now the government is very open and if you are you people are from some of them are, are of you are in private universities you can apply and then there are young researcher schemes so in young researcher schemes they are actually giving this uh, facility so that you can build up your facilities slowly and slowly and if not then this is just my uh, you can say advice to the young teachers that please synthesize because synthesis doesn't take much time synthesize it in your labs and characterization facilities are everywhere because you are in chandigarh so you have to just be that fire should be there ki i'll get this uh, get it characterized so because we are sitting here in delhi so for sem and tems and some other type of work we also go to iit delhi or iuc as i'm telling you that swift heavy ions have gone to the iuc and all so i think that can be done and uh, that's all uh, i can say that uh, if you have that fire in you please do not wait don't wait for the facilities to be developed at your institution start preparing it just go to one or two institutions and if you can characterize and then if you can think of a new chemistry new science your paper will be published and you will get a, a very strong uh, you can say foundation where you can approach the funding agencies and you can say now i have done the preliminary work give me fund and they are very open so you should start should not wait for the facilities so i i, I think especially for private institute participant uh, you have very good uh, this uh, example and then you should uh, not complain again to if you join my courses and then amity is getting so much funding and amity is also private university and government is not distinguishing about the private and government yes, so no, no, everyone can no distinction yes yes yeah, so, so everyone can get the funding yeah i i again want to ask one more question to you because uh, the, the, everyone I means is not like amity university and like not a chandig and is neta chandigarh or iits so they always want some help so this who are not at par with the uh, these uh, institutes so what kind of uh, infrastructure facilities or support you provide if any to the participant of other universities which are not comparable to you do you have any program or any strategy for that 
Right. Thank you so much for this question. Again, I'm telling you that in Amity, we actually respect the ideas, right? If somebody is coming with an idea that he or she wants to collaborate with us on that idea, then we distribute the work, right? And we are very much open to it because see, more people are there, more ideas would be there, right? And then we distribute and contribute the works. Okay, you prepare, synthesize this material, send it to us. We will do this uh, characterization and then we send the samples back. And then sometimes you also invite people to our campus. So, for example, some studies require longer stays so they can come and they can do their uh, characterizations, etc. with us, collaborate with us. First is that it has to be in collaboration to so collaborate with us and then uh, it will be done. If uh, we are very much open to it. I can give my email in the chat box. And if you want to write to me and if you want to have got some idea, but that idea should be there that yes, it, it's not that ki kya karna hai. if you have got an idea, you have to synthesize a compound and you are having some difficulty. Ki hamara sem nahi ho hai. For example, two or three techniques, which are hamara, uh, yeah, for example, IV characteristics, sem, or you can say you have to you know, go for sensor properties. You can write to me, right? And we can help in that respect because this is because I've been helped by somebody else. Why should not I help others? Yeah. So, uh, so the conclusion of everything is that to a participant that in the previous talk as well, uh, Dr. Paul was very open and then everyone is open and facilities are very much available right now. Government is also facilitating. Uh, Dr. Paul also told that we have the about uh, 50 centers, something he told like that. So you can approach them and you can pay them. There are pay, pay bases free facilities, collaboration, so everything is available. If you don't have facilities at your place, so that is not uh, something that can restrict you not to work. That should be, yeah. I have given my uh, email ID in the chat box. I've already given. I've yeah, just so typed my email ID so that uh, if, uh, people want to note down. They can approach me and I will, whatever help I could do, I will be able to, no problem. Yeah, so I, I don't see any more questions. If you have questions, you can, uh, write to them or if you want to unmute and talk to uh, ma'am or me then you can uh, uh, unmute you and uh, just uh, and say something if you want if you don't write anything and then yeah so i'm just still waiting for a few minutes few seconds say 30 seconds if you write something we can take the questions again If you want to speak, you can unmute and you can also speak. So I even don't see any questions. So I think. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There are no more questions. So yeah, before thanking the speaker, uh, I want to uh, uh, request the participant that next session will be at uh, 2.30. So please join 10 minutes early. And then those both uh, two more sessions are there. Both are from industry you can say industry one is director from uh, this uh, symbiosis institute of technology pune and another is a uh, this uh, ceo of uh, espilon electronics gujarat so uh, i hope that you will get exposure for the industry for this one and you should uh, attend those sessions everyone must attend those next two sessions we have two sessions left okay do you write and yeah you yeah, the question is, um, uh, ma'am, again to you, this can be use your research facilities. So, I, yes, I, I'm telling you, I've already given my uh, uh, email ID to you, and then you can write, Abito, we are all sitting in the lockdown only. And if you've got, if you write to me, and then I'll find out the suitable time, I may ask you to send the samples and I get it done with my, through my PhD scholars, they can do it with you. Or if you can come to they come over to Delhi, that I will let you know once you just write to me. Or if it if we could do it by just sending the samples and sending you the reports, we will be able to, we'll be happy to do that. Don't write. Yeah. Thank you, madam. We can, maybe we can take one last question. Uh, this is from Kola Koteswara Rao. Uh, his question is, how are the conducting polymer protected from degradation? 
uh, this is again a very uh, good question because when we say conducting polymers we have to take about uh, take care of their stability and please remember when we go for nano composites and we put reinforcing material they are they are they are long lasting even in my polymers uh, what i did when i did the when i prepared the polymers through simple methods and did their uh, sensing for nitrobenzene vapors i kept them and then when this idea of shi ions came i started using them through shi and they were not degraded much right the degradation was very very less because and then we started why it happened because they were Uh, actually protected by the dispersed uh, graphite sheets within them so then you can say that uh, uh, we can add certain additives or additives means that they should also contribute to the properties of the sensing it's not that just for the strength or the protecting them from the degradation we should add certain uh, uh, we can say reinforcing material where you can help them or you can maintain that uh, that problem should not be there uh, this uh, stability problem uh, instability pro problem should can be mitigated that you can do but yes you are very right that conducting polymers are prone to uh, degradation very fast so that is again a problem that is again a challenge but again that challenge we are trying to uh, overcome through putting some uh, reinforcing materials yeah thank you madam and uh, kola koteshwar rao i hope you got the answer for your question and then uh, um, Let's take one more question. Uh, that's from Kajal Sareria. Uh, Ma'am, every time crystalline polymers are preferable. This is question. Uh, no, uh, yeah, this is true. But it's not that every time crystalline polymers are preferable. When we go for nano composites, we are more into that. We uh, even the nano particles should disperse, and dispersity would introduce certain amorphization, right? So. no it's not true that every time crystalline polymers are preferable i would uh, not go for that you can take crystalline as well as the amorphous uh, ones the main thing is that interfaces the density of interfaces should be more and even though you take crystalline ones they will change into amorphization will occur because the of uh, your uh, you can say nano filler is going inside the crystallite regions because is if, if you see that the polymers should seep in into the layers so if it seep is seeps into the layers naturally amorphization would take place so it's not that you have to take only crystalline ones i think there are no more questions and right. then uh, this talk was a really wonderful talk i can see the appreciation from the participant in the chat box so they are writing the wonderful session yeah many things in very informative so superb session so uh i think participant uh, will really get benefit from this for their teaching uh, and as well for their research so yeah we are very much thankful for you madam for taking this session and thank you so much it was really nice session and we hope in future also we will accept our request and go join some more sessions in the next program thank you yes, madam thank you very much thank you so much sir for giving me the opportunity so thank you so much sir so i can uh, i can leave sir Thank you. Yeah, the association is formally over, so all the participants and the madam, yeah, yeah, everyone is free to leave now. So we will again join at two thirty. Thank you. See you again you. at two thirty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you.